Wow, and the horrific incidents that have happened in Minneapolis and then as a touchstone to all this stuff that's going on around our country and the aftermath of this latest horrible human tragedy. I love the fact, again, that Doc Rivers, the coach of the Los Angeles Clippers, said this is not a black-white issue. This is a human issue. There is not any excuse, reason, justification for what happened to Mr. Floyd up in Minneapolis. And we grieve with your family, and we love you. Um, we serve several churches in Indianapolis through mission trips and through gifts. I hope one day to, to meet you as a family because we want to show you that love of Christ. And, and we're, I'm just sorry that that's happened. But here's what we want to try to do and what we're trying to accomplish today. And as you share this with other people, is to have the conversation that's going to be helpful. And so my guest now is Dr. Jerry Johnson. Um, Jerry has a long and distinguished career as a public servant. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell them since she retired. She's retired with the FBI, so um, she knows where all the bodies are buried and all that kind of stuff of all the things that I've done wrong in my past. And that's a horrible thing to say within this context. Please edit that out. Um, but, but Jerry and I met when I was coming home from Ethiopia after uh, being on a plane coming back from a mission trip to Africa, and Dylan Roof had just killed this congregation of people in Pinckney's Church in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Mother Emanuel. Mother Emanuel Church. And, and just the incredible, horrible, awful, horrific tragedy that that was. And I could, I could give adjectives for the next year and it not touch it. Um, and she, we were talking, I got an email from her. When I landed on the plane, it's the first thing I saw when I hit American soil. And it was a, a, an invitation to talk about this incident and to address it. And that's how I met Jerry. Mm -hmm. And so we've had many meaningful conversations since then. And I want to begin that conversation again today or continue, begin it today that was continued from days past and years past because I trust your wisdom. And I also understand that there are things that you've gone through that I will never fully understand. But I can try. Whether I'm a white male or there are white females out there or Latino males and females, other people of color. So here's the first question I would just ask you. Let's just take it from here and we'll run with it. Okay. Given what you know about being a black mother of black sons in America, help especially those that are here to understand What's that like, and how does that feel for you right now, and how visceral and emotional is that for you? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say um, to you, Pastor Ray, I am uh, I'm excited um, and thankful um, to be able to share my feelings. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, it's been um, it's been a rough week, a rough month for anybody who hasn't been under a rock, and so. Uh, I'm glad to share my feelings and hopefully the feelings that are similar with other black moms of sons. Um, if you're not aware, recently we just had a, another killing of a black man, Mr. George Floyd. And it personally caused me to reflect, to stop and reflect on the fact that I have two adult sons. Uh, they happen to be uh, Mr. Floyd's age. And so uh, for me, what what actually happened, the emphasis of me um, really being shaken by it all, was that continued image that kept being played uh, over and over of the gentleman lying on the ground. And I literally saw my son in his place, who happened to be in their 40s as well. And when the gentleman called for his mother, I hope I don't lose it here, um, mm -hmm. it was me not being able to reach my children. So. I battled with that. Uh, You've been and, having nightmares about it. Yes, I battled with that in context of I'm a Christian, I know God's promises, you know, and yet I was totally shaken. I was unprepared for the kind of reaction. And so I immediately started making phone calls. Are you all right? Da -da -da, are you right? And my sons individually, and I don't even want to put them out there, started telling me about other instances that they had had where similar things had happened to them, mm -hmm. which was best kept from their mother, mm, <laughs> I yeah. assure you. 
Right. Uh, but again, so that confirmed what I was watching, what I was dreaming, and um, it caused me to basically shut down for the past week. I've really been kind of a recluse, um, re-examining my relationships with people who are white, in particular, who say they love me, uh, people who are my friends who are in law enforcement, who are white, but I've worked alongside of them as colleagues, mm -hmm. and I've been in different situations where they've protected my life. And uh, we've served together and, 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 and many times worshiped together, you know. So I'll also say, you, you won't throw this out there, yeah. but you've served black and white presidents. Absolutely. You've been somebody Absolutely. to help provide security, advice, detail Correct. for them. Correct. Rep Republicans and Democrats. Right. Okay. So not, uh, no partisanship whatsoever. Right. You're just doing your job. Doing my job. Uh, provided security for them. Uh, you know, all kinds of counseling for their personal needs, insurances, and things of that nature. So yes, I've been a public servant to Which both means, to both sides. So that has you. never been an issue, and my job has been one where I have been fortunate enough to uh, to promulgate diversity and inclusion everywhere I went, even when it was about the job. Uh, but back to me personally, um, the biggest issue that I've had recently is that I have um, witnessed some very uh, unseemly behavior among the saints. <laughs> and so that's really who I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are of the world, you know, I'm still praying for them because God is taking his time to come back. Uh, Jesus is taking his time so that none will perish. So, you know, when people say, oh, I can't wait for the Lord to return, I'm one of those people who say, no, nah, I don't think so. Because <laughs> there's some people still need yeah, some work. Yeah, still people, yeah. <laughs> I got people in my family still need to be saved, okay? <laughs> So I'm not asking Jesus to come back, and I'm not trying to see him tomorrow either. Um, but I am concerned that we are not using our voice. And so I made an appeal to my white sisters and brothers to speak out when you see something that is wrong, uh, to say something to your Uncle Frank, you know, when he says something that is unseemly about a person of color. Uh, I've been asked many, many times, um, well, Jerry, what can we do? You know, I'm not a protester. I'm not a person who carries a sign. Well, you don't have to do that. Live the life. You know, act it out in your everyday exchanges. You know, invite me over for dinner. Amen. <laughs> That's one way to start. Or you've even come had to my house. this week where people yeah. have been bringing you dinner, right? Exactly. You know, come to my house. Let me come to yours. Get to know people who don't look like you. Yes. That's the only answer because it's going to take, okay, we're going to vote. Everybody should. We need legislation. We need policies. But we need to start with each person realizing that the impact comes one person, one heart at a time. Right. So this is what I say to people who have called me this week. I got a lot of phone calls, uh, again, from people who either saw my post or who didn't get a return phone call <laughs> because, like I said, I went on this self-imposed hiatus. And uh, from my white friends, oh, Jerry, we miss you. We love you. I saw your post. Are you okay? And um, for the most part, I never respond on social media because I don't like debates. Um, but I did. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. So, but I did respond to those who seemed uh, genuinely concerned, and I didn't want to um, further, you know, harm them or have them think that something was wrong with me. Yes, ma'am. So one person in my, in my neighborhood in particular, and I, I, I must bring her up because her reaching out to me touched me the most. Yeah. And her name is Lisa Harrington. And hey, Lisa, you get to see this. Um, Lisa Harrington lives in my neighborhood, um, foster mom, both she and her husband. And I got to give you the background on this, too. Um, we have our own Facebook group for our community. And um, quite some time ago, she put out a post just to our media group asking if people would be willing to sign up or basically reach out to her to give respite to she and her husband when they decided to go on a date. And she said, hey, you know, I'm a foster mom. I have to know that you're clearable, that you're secure and safe and, and mm -hmm. someone that could be, you know, uh, qualified to basically keep the kids. Yes, so I love kids. I mean, I have one grandson and everybody else who has a kid that's a baby or a toddler or anybody, they belong to me. I am Yaya, I am Gma, <laughs> I am Grandma, I am Mama G. I'm all of the above to include Dr. Geraldine Johnson. Yeah. But Dr. that's G my me. that's my favorite role. That's my favorite role. Just all the babies. I love them. So I volunteered. I responded on Facebook. I'd be glad to do it. You know, you need to meet me and find out if the kids are comfortable. So uh, we had this meeting where um, they were going out to dinner and she wanted to leave the children asleep 
so that I would basically only have to come and sit there, read a book until they returned. Yes, but I wouldn't agree to that because I, I love children and I don't want them to feel uncomfortable, you know, and I thought if they wake up in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and mommy and daddy aren't here, mm -hmm. you know, this, they're going to be, they're going to be uh, upset. So I said, how about I come maybe an hour before you leave, you see how the children and I interact, and then if you feel comfortable that they are comfortable, and I feel comfortable that they are comfortable. How kind and thoughtful is it that? It goes both ways. Yeah. Kids need to be comfortable, you need to be comfortable, I need to be comfortable. Right. <laughs> Once all of that is, is confirmed, then you go on, have your date, leave me with the babies. So I show up, I got games, I got every, I, this is not my first rodeo. Kids pretty much love me. And so uh, I come in and we have dinner, we have pizza and everything, and the kids generally take to me and I tell them, okay, now you can leave a little earlier to start your date, do whatever married people do. I got this. I had the best time cool. with the children. Three siblings and uh, two girls and a boy. They were great to keep and they loved me. And so after that, I kept them maybe a couple more times and uh, they attend church here. I would be on the welcome desk. They would bolt from her hands and arms and run up to me and just hug me. Oh. I mean, it was the best thing happening. Mm -hmm. So when this issue uh, happened with Mr. Floyd and the post went out and everything, Lisa texts me and she says, uh, once she finds out that I'm fine, I'm not sick, you know, I'm being careful for my age and being in the vulnerable group, um, what can I do? I mean, I have lived in a bubble. I have lived white privilege in an unconscious way. These are her words. These are her words in an unconscious way. I've not weaponized it like the lady in Central Park. I've not, it's just nothing that ever occurred to me that's any different about you than me. Mm -hmm. And then she also went on to say, I've also had a number of foster children come through my home, two in particular that were black, two black boys. She said, but here's the thing, and this is the revelation that she shared. Um, so she's been a part-time mother for a time part -time to black mom children. To black children. As a white mother. She said, I just heard a mother on television who was shouting, white people don't understand. I have to tell my black sons, you know, how to behave and how to walk mm -hmm. and what to say and all of this every single day. Mm -hmm. And she reflected when I kept my boys, my sons, my two black children, it never occurred to me to have that talk. Mm -hmm. I never thought that someone would treat them differently because of the color of their skin. So what a revelation. So now I'm learning, this is what you have to do every day. I open her. That's right. So now it's another little tool in her toolkit. Right. If she's ever you know, privileged to shelter uh, young boys again, and they're black, she's gotta know this is a part of the culture we live in. So she said, in essence, I get it. I get it. I get it. I never had a white person say that to me. Wow. In all of your life. In my life. In your 40 in years. My, yeah, right. That's very <laughs> kind of you. I don't mind being in my 60s. Uh, uh, I never had. I had people who uh, would assume they got it. Uh, I had people who would act like they got it. Uh, but they but I never it. heard anybody say, I get it. Yeah. Because... We never had the conversation. Yes, ma'am. And so now, um, with all of the tragedy, now with all of the things that have happened very recently, I'm excited. Yes, ma'am. I'm excited that this door is opening. Um, I can't give anybody absolution. So this is my appeal to my white friends, my brothers and my sisters who know me, who know Jerry. Um, I can't give you a pass. <laughs> I can't. I'm not a priest. Um, but what I can tell you is I'm ready to have a conversation. Amen. Uh, and what you can do in the meantime, if you're not one who is, uh, you know, subject to going out and, and protesting, if that's not your thing, or uh, carrying signs or throwing confetti, that's not necessary. You can start at home by teaching your children that everybody has value. Amen. Everybody is important. Start having the conversations with yourself about not flinching every time you see a person of color. I'm gonna pay. I'm gonna tell you a little story that happened to me. Essentially, Daryl used the word suspicion. That's There's right. A natural Suspe inherent suspicion. Absolutely, and 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 that's what this story is gonna be about that I'll share. 
I like to shop in Ross, so they just got a plug. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this got happened. This? Yeah, this Four one. Four ninety nine last week. I got this. One. <laughs> so, hey, uh, Ross, we'll be there for some contributions, <laughs> right? Exactly, here. right. Anyway. Here. But in any event, this happened long before any of the recent uh, tensions that we've been um, experiencing. Where I was shopping in Ross, right, he right here in Gastonia, and I noticed right away um, one of their employees. They called them risk management personnel. In case you didn't know. They're people who they're really are dressed as <laughs> they're dressed as shoppers, yeah. uh, just so you know. And their job is to minimize loss. So they go around the store and they look for people who may otherwise be shoplifting. I can always scope them out, but of course that's part of my training. Yes, uh, so anyway, I was in the store and I'm in Ross and like I really keep them in business. Anytime I get you know I get a chance, I'm in there buying something that I don't need. And so um, I noticed right away that a woman was was tracking me. And um, here I am, gray-haired, everything. I'm thinking, why? I can't even, I can't get out of here that fast. <laughs> so, but none, nonetheless, she was tracking me. And I noticed, and I, I made eye contact, not to say, I see you watching me, but really just to say, I see you watching me. <laughs> yep. And so she continued to think she was keeping a distance. I continued to keep my eye on her peripherally as she was watching me. And then as I continued to shop, I ignored her. I noticed a white female who was shoplifting. Next to you. Next to, I mean, literally, she was like clothes in the big bag, looking around furtively, and I started laughing. I laughed out loud because I'm like, How ironic. You're missing the, the thief, you yeah. know? But the assumption was I was black, maybe I wasn't dressed, uh, you know, to her liking, or maybe I looked like I was someone uh, without. And that immediately set the profile that that's her target. Mm -hmm. So again, it's those kinds of things. We live in this skin and we experience this every day. And so what I'm asking my white sisters and brothers to understand is that you don't know what that's like. Right. And you don't know the toll that it takes on you over and over again when you're trying to live a Christian life, when you're trying to live where you love everybody, when you're trying to live where you have to love people who even despise you. You know why? Because Jesus said so. He didn't suggest it. He didn't recommend it. He said, love your brother. Right. That's what you're supposed to do. And I try to do it. And I like telling pastors sometimes, I think Jesus was gangster. <laughs> um, uh, because he, you know, my Jesus, my Jesus was multifaceted. Certainly he prayed. He was obedient to the Father. But he lived among the transgressors. Yes, ma'am. You know, he never became one, but he hung out with right. them. He partied he, with them. He sin rolled the with time. them. That's right. You know, that's how he rolled. So he knew everything about them. Right. He knew their weaknesses. He right. knew their strengths. That's the kind of Jesus I serve. Amen. And so when I deal with other people who don't know, who treat me otherwise than a human being, I try to extend that grace. But I must admit to you, it takes its toll. It does. It's very, very hard. And once I, you begin, to, once I've discovered as I've understood in small ways, yeah. then it helps me to understand where you're coming from. Yes. I, want, I want you to talk about two incidents, yeah. at least. Uh, the first one I want you to talk about is what it was like to be uh, a black girl in New Jersey. Whoa. What it was? Yeah. North, the, ice, the ice cream North cone East. is what I want you to tell us oh, about. Oh, wow. Pastor, you And, 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 you and take, then, yeah. then I want you to tell us about something else, but let's go there first okay. of all. So all imagine right. your child, Jerry, how old were you? I was eight. eight I was years eight old. years old. Okay. So I, I think just to give you a little backdrop, many of you, or perhaps some of you may have seen the movie, The Help. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, and uh, so that movie basically epitomized, if you will, the plight of black domestic workers, uh, which my mother happened to be one. And when I was eight years old, my mother served two families that lived uh, in the suburbs of New Jersey. And during the, um, the summertime when I was not in school, which was a, a babysitter of sorts where she could work and I was taking care of for those hours, I would have to accompany her to work. Now, mind you, I lived in North New Jersey. Google it. It's not the best town still. They call it Brick City. I still rather um, fly in the Newark than LaGuardia. Yes, or JFK. but my mom still raised me with values. I went to school. I did what I was told. But we were economically situated where, even though my dad was present and my dad worked, my mother still needed to work to supplement our, our family income. So when she had to go to do what you call domestic work, 
uh, much to my chagrin, I had to go with her in the summertime. So she would drag me on three buses, because my mother didn't drive, and we would show up, we took care of two homes, and in, let's see, I was born in 1954, so eight, and in 1960, in New Jersey, in the North, I was not welcome in either of the homes where she worked. Wow. So I had to sit outside on the porch mm -hmm. and wait while she worked an eight hour day. Yeah, can you imagine? I did it in the rain, I did it in the snow. Of course, I would be bundled up and everything. Mm -hmm. She covered me with a parker and all that. And the most entertainment I would get is if she would give me some silverware to polish to kind of keep me from being idle. Mm -hmm. But she babysat other people's children who she took to swimming lessons, tennis lessons, and I would follow her there and just sit on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. So during one of the times that she took um, the two, there were boys, the two boys to a swimming lesson, we decided we'd take a break and, and go get an ice cream. So we get on the community jitney, which is free. She had a pass because she was a helper and um, we were able to ride it for free. And we went down to the little area where it was a kiosk and my mother brought the newspaper. My mother was a, uh, just an avid reader, which I am today. And she was going to read and for her lunch hour and I was to sit there and swing my feet and, and get my ice cream and eat it. So she gave me 25 cents to go up to the, um, the counter to get, um, I called it a Dixie cup. Mm -hmm. And they come in the little cups and you get a little wooden cups, spoon, you peel, the top off. peel the top off, you got a little wooden mm -hmm. spoon. And um, I asked, um, after waiting in line, about five minutes or so, uh, a young kid who was working for the summer, he was about 16, I said, may I have a vanilla um, Dixie cup, please? And I handed him my money, which was 25 cents a quarter. And um, I just went on my way. I brought it back to where my mother was on the bench. And I sat down, and when I took the top off, it was chocolate. Mm. I don't like chocolate. Mm -hmm. I don't like it today. Okay. And so my mother looked down, and she called me my little pet name. And she said, baby girl, what are you doing with a chocolate Dixie cup? And I said, mom, he gave me the wrong flavor. You know, and they're just in a white container. You can't even see the label. You know, they might have bought it in bulk or something. I don't know. So anyway, my mom, being my mom, folded up her paper, and she's like, oh, this is a quick fix. We just go back and tell them they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you want me to go with you? I said, no, I can do it by myself. I just didn't think it was that easy a fix. So um, I proceeded to go back and took uh, the Dixie cup, waited in line, because there were other people making purchases, I get up to the line, I'm eight, the kid's 16, no more than 16. And I said, excuse me, um, I just paid for Dixie Cup, you gave me chocolate, I really don't like chocolate, I like vanilla. And the kid starts using these expletives to include the N-word mm -hmm. and tells me I don't belong here anyway, and so be gone. Mm -hmm. So now I have to go back to tell my mother, you weren't right, mom, it's not that simple. Mm. And uh, so I go back, she's reading the paper, and now I'm in tears. And I said, see, you told me to go back and it didn't work, I told him again. She said, oh no, absolutely not, um, I'll fix it. So she folds up her paper and we go back, we wait in line, and she gets up to the gentleman again, the kid, who's 16, and at this time, because my mother had me, she was 40, so she was 48, <laughs> and um, she says, hey, uh, son, you know, she's a, an adult. Son, uh, my daughter just bought this, uh, this Dixie cup and you gave her the wrong uh, flavor by mistake. So could she please have a vanilla? So she was still trying to be Correct. peaceful. Correct, absolutely. That's how she operated. And the young man, he cursed her out. He used all kinds of foul names. He also called my mother the N-word. And I was afraid that she was going to get in trouble and I wouldn't have a mother. Mm. So I'm like, mom, this is not how we do this. We need to just, I'll just eat the chocolate. Mm. And she says, no, that's, that's not okay. You would have never asked for chocolate because you don't eat chocolate. Mm -hmm. This was their mistake. They need to fix it. So be quiet and stop crying. Then she turned back to the young fella and she said, can I see your manager? And he says, sure. He goes in the back to get a manager. The manager's like 18. <laughs> wow. Manager comes out and says, what's the problem? My mother explains it again for time. And he says, look, if you don't leave, we're gonna call the police. And so they proceed to call the police and my mother's still standing in line. 
Wow. People behind us are jarring and pointing and yelling and calling us the oh, N-word and telling us we don't belong there and we're nothing but the help and my mother doesn't move. I am in tears. Mm -hmm. Now I'm afraid we're both going to jail mm -hmm. and she's gonna lose her job and we're late to pick up the boys from swimming. Mm -hmm. So all of that is going through my mind as an eight year old. So the police do show up, uh, either security for the village or whatever, and they ask what happens, my mother explains, and he said, ma'am, look, you know, if your daughter asks for the wrong flavor, that's not their problem. She said, officer, she didn't. He said, well, you're going to have to get out of line or I'm going to have to take you in. And like I said, I'm not a protester, but my mom was bad. Yeah, okay? she stayed my, around. My mom was a protester, okay? And, uh, and, and she, she, did it, she did it with class. Mm -hmm. So she stood her ground and she said, um, well, officer, you'll just have to take me in because uh, I'm not leaving here until my daughter gets her vanilla Dixie cup. And so uh, he pleaded actually with the 18 year old and he said, for the love of God, I'll pay for it myself. <laughs> and he put the money down and they gave me the vanilla and we went on our way. Wow. So if, <laughs> if you're white, like me, you probably don't understand that. There are probably some Hispanics that do. Yes, I'm sure. They're, yeah, yeah. But imagine you're a six-year-old or eight-year-old. Eight. eight, I, was eight. At that time. I was eight years old. She was 48. Yeah. So here's the other thing I want to take us to mm -hmm. next, if, if you don't mind exploring mm -hmm. this some more. Mm -hmm. Something you shared with me just yesterday mm -hmm. about being um, a young black mom of two young children. Oh, trying to get the relevant. Tra yes, ma'am. Ah! And, and married to a military man. Yes. <laughs> in ma holy matrimony correct, together. Correct, correct, yes. And yes. You, you were both just be struggling just Absolutely. to make it. Absolutely, yes. And so you decided to go to appeal right. to yes. the governmental system to get some assistance. Correct. Tell us correct. what happened. Yeah. Right. Okay, Pastor's telling like all my secrets. Oh, well. Uh, well you don't have to it, tell them all. <laughs> but again, um, having this kind of dialogue with him, it gives me an opportunity to vent. Number and it one. also gives everybody an opportunity and to understand. it gives me a chance to really share some of the experiences that I've had in my life that perhaps would have never been told. Right. No, it's not going to be on the news. It's not going to be in print. Um, but they are daily lived examples. But the one he's talking about right now that I was happy to share with him was simply to explain how nothing that's happening today is brand new. I don't, I don't even like people acting like this brand new because it's not. Mm -hmm. It's just something that we talk about, then the situation ebbs, and then another, and then we talk about it again, but we never take action. Right. So the incident that I shared with him was, uh, I got married, I was a teenage mom, and I had my son uh, at 18, and uh, my husband uh, at the time, his father was in the military, and uh, I was a stay-at-home mom, and we were both students in college. Yes, ma'am. Uh, he was going to Montclair State, I was going to a teacher's college, Newark Teacher's College. Um, and um, during the course of one of our actual evening family meetings, we were looking at our meager salaries because he worked part-time uh, after school. I worked part-time in what you know as Walmart now. It used to be called Woolco or the five and 10 cent store, mm -hmm. the five and dime. And I worked there and I did trash and I did cashier work and all of that to make ends meet. So we were looking at our money collectively, which wasn't much. And I got this bright idea why don't we apply for food stamps? You know, <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, my children's father, even to this day, is very proud. And he's like, what do you mean? Food stamps are for people who are quote unquote, you know, lazy and all, you know, he bought into the narrative. Mm -hmm. And I put a different perspective on it. I said, I think anybody that's able to get food stamps, which means you get a hundred dollars in coupons to purchase food, but you only pay, and by the way, folks, you pay, you only pay $50 for it, that's a smart move. Right. Sure. I don't understand how that's not smart. Absolutely. So I said, but I think a lot of people don't do it because they don't want to do the paperwork, mm -hmm. they don't want, and they discourage you by making it a difficult process. process. Mm -hmm. I don't mind if at the end of that, I keep my eyes on the prize, and that's we have a little baby here, and we get $100 worth of groceries, but we're only spending 50 
So he agrees to go with me and we go downtown to Newark, Broad Street, to the local uh, social services office. We wait in line. You know what that's like. You people go to DMV and social security. Oh yeah. You pull the little tab and you wait five hours. So we finally get our turn and he's holding my, my son, who is now 48, holding him on his lap. And I'm going to go in to talk to the agent, you know, and uh, so I do. And I got all my paperwork, my name, social security number, everything. I've already filled out the paperwork. And this beautiful, kind, thoughtful, older than me white woman is the reception agent that I get. And she says, yeah, all your paperwork seems to be in order. She said, except one thing. And she does her glasses like this, so I'm doing it to make a point. She said, who's that gentleman out there um, sitting waiting for you? And I said, oh, that's my son's father. That's my husband. And she says, oh, you're married? Mm. <laughs> like, oh. I was like, uh, Come on. yes, we are like, real, we're married. Right. You know, we live in public housing, but we're married. Uh, in fact, he insisted that we get married, you know, uh, because that's what you do, Amen. you know. And so um, I said, yeah, what, what's the problem? And like I shared, she explained, well, you really, really can't get this if you're married. Wow. The way it's designed is to supplement single parents who have no partners or spouses so that they can get supplemental income. So I said, so let me, let me understand this. <laughs> I speak English. <laughs> you're, you didn't stutter, but I, I need clarification. You're telling me that the only way I can qualify and get these food stamps. Now, this was my experience mm -hmm. with this agent. This is not okay, some so, story, some else. No, no, this no. Is this is me, and other people can have their own experience. But this was my true to life experience, and I wanted to be clear because understand, I wanted the food stamps. I, that's why I went. Sure. I wasn't going to be ashamed to purchase them and pay whatever portion of my and income was required, and I wanted them because I saw it as a means to helping me feed my family more healthy foods and, and to have more income to supplement us in other ways. So um, she said, yeah, that's kind of how it works. I said, so what am I supposed to do about my husband? She said, well, you know, that's kind of up to you, but you could say you're not married, but if you do, just keep in mind, we do random home visits. So I can't describe to you how the office layout was, but my husband heard that. He had my son, and he rushed in, and he said, wait a, and he used some words that were not nice. You're telling my wife. First of all, he goes, I didn't want to come in the first place. You know, he gives mm -hmm. me that now. Mm -hmm. um, but I came because it seemed to make sense that we are working, we're struggling, and by the way, we're paying our own college tuition. We didn't have grants. We didn't have loans. We were paying, you know, the $50 right. a month plan on mm -hmm. the loans and all that to finish our degrees. And he says, the only way my wife can get food stamps for herself and my son is if I say I'm not taking care of my family. Wow. And if I jump out of a window because you're doing a home visit. Wow. Absolutely not. And he grabbed me up and my son and he tore the paper up and everything and he left it there. So I never got food stamps. I don't know what it's like to get the cheese. And so it's easy for somebody <laughs> to create a narrative and say, well, it's like the old Bruce Hornsby song, <laughs> just for son, yeah. just get a job. Right, right. It's easy to think that, but you've experienced those kinds of things Absolutely. when you were genuinely in need. That's correct. So the, the last thing we talked about yesterday that I hope you'll address, so now we move forward. How, how do we get better? And you said two things that are very profound one about silence yeah and one about understanding yeah so what you didn't say to me mm -hmm. is what we don't want from you is a given amount of money uh, no, I don't uh want to hear that. <laughs> for you to say something in the newspaper for you to come out and protest right, for us right, right. You, you even say that's not your groove that's and that not, kind of stuff although not. those of you that protest that's, that's amazing that's we, we admire that and, and right. do so peaceably right but but what you said were about silence and that's about right. understanding. That's right. That those are the two things you Correct. want the most. Yeah. So talk about that silence right. as golden comment. Right. And then okay. also talk about what Lisa's the understanding thing. Understanding. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, really, yeah, two things. So having this opportunity, like I said, is great. The first is um, 
again, when I was in school, you know, elementary school, everything takes me back to that. I was told I was very talkative. I don't know. Huh. I was told that. No. <laughs> anyway, my mother was constantly being called to school one time or another from the time I was in kindergarten to third grade uh, because I was, quote, unquote, talkative as far as, again, my white teachers were concerned. And it was, for me, nothing more than questioning things, asking questions, Curious. challenging, curiosity. Yeah. But it, again, I was labeled as the talkative kid. And I always ended up getting punished by having to write silence is golden mm. on the uh, chalkboard. Back in the day, early 50s, that's when I was born um, and went to elementary school, we had these classrooms that almost three quarters of the classroom was chalkboard. Mm -hmm. And so while the other kids were out having recess or having a playtime to punish you, if it wasn't you or any other kid, the teacher would sit in the classroom and have you write that until your arms got tired and supposedly you would remember to be quiet. It never taught me that. It just taught me to not get caught and to stop asking questions that perhaps I still should have been able to ask. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I was you know, always writing and having to do that. And um, as a reflection of today and fast forward, I was thinking about those times and I shared with uh, Pastor Ray, silence is not golden. It might be golden if you're in the class and you're being disruptive. Okay, I'll give you that. That's one setting where that might be appropriate. But when you are in an environment where you are observing social injustices, mm -hmm. where you are observing people being mistreated, mm -hmm. where you are observing people uh, being uh, uh, treated with violence that is undeserved, and you are silent, that is not golden. That is consent. Right. That is saying it's okay with me. Wrong. And it's wrong. And what I've been telling you know, my white sisters and brothers in particular is that you need to speak out. You don't have to protest. You don't have to throw confetti. You don't have to carry a sign. You know, I want you to start small. And I'm not giving you a pass. When I say start small, you might have to start with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And you are afraid, well, if I say I agree that that officer was wrong, my neighbor might not invite me to the cookout. You know, mm -hmm. so that's my challenge to you. You might not get that hot dog, but you'll feel better because mm -hmm. you stood up for somebody who didn't have a voice. And then the other thing I want to say before I finish that is, because I can't speak for all black people. That's another thing I, I share with my white brothers and sisters. We are not a monolith, that's right. okay? That's right. I never think all white people are the same. If I did, I wouldn't love my pastor. Amen. So we shouldn't I, think we, all black people You shouldn't people think all same. black people right. are the same. You need to judge people by their individual behavior, actions, conduct, character, etc. Amen, amen. That's amen, what you amen, need amen. to do. I don't think all people are like Dylan Roth. I don't think that. I think people make choices, you know, based on decisions of their own experiences, and they can be good and bad regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your race. So please stop doing that. Yeah. Stop making that assumption. Stop saying it and stop buying into the narrative when you see it on the news. Isn't it really just an easy way to slot people into yeah. a place so that you don't have to take time to get to know You don't have to, to step out of your comfort zone. You don't have to get to know them. Right. You don't have to get to know what they think. And then also, I assure you, even after many of you see this, you'll find out you really didn't know me because we never had the conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, as wonderful as I am. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You didn't, you didn't really take the, the opportunity to get to know me. And I think that's kind of a part of our human dynamic. We just pass each other, you know, going and coming. But because we are at a point of crisis now, we right. can't afford to be that way. Right. And uh, so the last thing is on the empathy and the understanding. Um, I personally belong to a number of consortiums in Charlotte that deal with race. Uh, the most prominent one uh, that I am a part of is called RMJJ and the acronym uh, stands for Race Matters for Juvenile Justice. Yes, and I joined that when I first arrived here in the area because I wanted to just become more involved as a citizen. I was moving to a new area and I thought, now I got the time, I'm not working. But um, this is a consortium of folks who meet, um, just like the conversation we're having now, and we talk about the relations that are causing the tensions among us here in Charlotte. And this group is white people, Asian people, black people, Hispanic people, 
uh, they're from all diverse industries and walks of life. You have mothers, fathers, doctors, lawyers mm -hmm. who are having the conversation mm -hmm. and they want to know as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we should be courageous enough as the body to have those conversations. Amen. I think we could fill uh, uh, a church, sure. if you will, sure. where we are courageous enough because we have one thing in common that the world doesn't, that's right. and that's supposed to be the love of Christ. Amen. So that should give us the comfort, if you will, to be bold because what we have protecting us is love. Right. That's why I can speak out, because I do it in love. So you make a point I think is so. important to piggyback off just a moment, is that the local church is the hope of the world. Yeah. When you talk about the body, you're talking about the body Absolutely. of Christ. Each one of us Absolutely. are members of it. Correct. And so we Outside of these four walls. We don't need to wait for the capital C church. No, we don't. We don't need to wait for the government to pass a law because it's Correct. not ever going to be right enough. That's right. That's it, right. It starts with those of with us, us that love as a matter of Absolutely. privilege and purpose that right. God's given us to love one mm -hmm. another. And in fact, I'll tell you, we're, um, we're about to take that step. Uh, even in my community, we are actually having a, um, a vigil. It's coming Friday. And I live in a community um, that's predominantly white. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm known to be a good neighbor. Yeah. And uh, I've been getting people ask me questions about what I wanted to do. And it wasn't my idea. People text me individually. And I actually, um, I declined to spearhead it. Because another thing, I, I, I have to leave you with this because I have to be totally honest, and since I have the opportunity, um, black people can't fix it. It really is not a problem we can fix. Because you have to learn what it is like to be like us. Yes. Because you have no real sense of it. Mm -hmm. So we're, I, I won't use the V word because I, I don't consider myself a victim, but we are the non-essential players, because we are a part of what happens, but we don't really affect it. So me being in a store where I'm treated the way I'm treated and I try to follow the rules, the next person I get to is white. The next person I get to is white. That's the power structure, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's, it's your job if you're so inclined, or like they say on Mission Impossible, this is your mission if you choose just to take it. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Because there is a majority and there's a minority. Correct, correct. And, yeah. and it just makes sense. And I mean, until, that's the practical Until the majority begins to understand or, or at least try to understand. Try to, try to. That's so right. I'll, I'll close yeah. with this time. But I, I would invite you, if you want to say anything else afterwards, please yeah. do so. Mm -hmm. but, but there's this moment that happened in my life several years ago. And... Uh, I'm probably going to get emotional talking about it. I'm going to try not to without being inappropriate. But it's on my house. My, my wife and my daughter and I were on a Sunday evening headed in different directions. Um, and we had two cars and three people with three directions. And so I wanted to go see the help. <laughs> and I live about a mile from the Franklin Square Theater in Gastonia. So I thought, well, you know what, I'll just... I'll just have one of them drop me off, and I'll walk home, and Abigail can have my car to go do her thing, and Andrew's going to go do her thing, because Andrew is the queen house, so <laughs> she's definitely going to go do her thing, because if Mama's not happy... Nobody. That's right, okay, anyway, so Mama's Everybody happy, knows. and Abigail's happy, too, because I like to make sure that my girls are happy, too. So, I, you know, I, I went down to the movie, and I, I, I watched it, and mm -hmm. within about, gosh, I can't remember when it started, but first, I got hit in the gut... And it almost felt like a punch. And then I felt like this finger pointing in my face. Because as I, I listened to some of those white women talk <laughs> to their domestic Helpers. employees, mm -hmm. that that's the way my people were. Mm -hmm. Not my parents. Right, right. But people my you know. But my, my grandparents, mm -hmm. many of my aunts and uncles, and it, it made me sick yeah. in such a way so that, uh, and it was just an emotional experience. I'm, I'm a 59-year-old mm -hmm. man. Um, I'll be 60 soon. So <laughs> You'll be in the club. That's right, I'll be in the club. <laughs> Seven-decade club. I'm only halfway home. <laughs> I'm going to fight him. To I, just, I told you, I'm asking for those Hezekiah years. That's right. That's right. I'm going to have to be 110. They have to beat me to death with a stick, and I'm going to fight him back. <laughs> anyway, 
So I'm walking back across from the Franklin Square Theater in front of what is now Ashley Furniture mm -hmm. and uh, the ice cream, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and I'm I'm a, I'm a grown man, and this is ten years ago. Mm -hmm. When was it? Whenever that was. Yeah, eight, about, ten years about ago. that long. Yeah, with Viola and Davis. I, I started crying, mm -hmm. and I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And you know the parking lot was des deserted. There was nobody there then, mm -hmm. but I remembered that that I, my people were part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that it's part of my responsibility now to use every tool that I have mm -hmm. to be able to rectify that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I know I can't make it go away, right? But I don't want to be silent. Good. And neither do I just want to go get in line somewhere. Although I respect those that are in line respectfully mm -hmm. and peaceably. Mm -hmm. um, but your tr your courage in sharing how you feel is invaluable and, yeah. and, and how we can understand. Yeah. So as I gather specifically as we close again, mm -hmm. is to seek to understand. Years ago, when Stephen Covey wrote something that is a truth that we all understand, the seven habits of highly effective people, people, seek to understand rather than to be understood. Right, right. More often than not, we use social media and whatever platforms we have to go, understand me, yeah. understand what yeah. I'm trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. But instead, what if we instead turn that and say, I want to understand you right. instead of popping off because ultimately what really that comes down to a lot of times is, is pride. It's, it's really about, I want to have the final answer. Mm -hmm. I want to have the final say so. But here's what I hope that we've been able to discover here today. And for those of you that are watching at all times, you might watch this three years from now and we hope it helps is that when we seek to understand, it makes a difference. Yeah. And the greatest gift that I heard, the most emotional I heard you give in the last 24 hours or so as we've discussed this conversation a couple of times is, Lisa says she understands me. Right. She and does. nobody ever said that before. Nobody did. So nobody did. People don't so much want your money. People don't want so much even your power unless you're using it to understand what people that are other want us to understand is it's not other, it's us. That's right. Um, I love what Tony Evans said, and I guess it's controversial, but Tony Evans is an is a African-American pastor. Oh, I know I, him very well. That I admire Priscilla's a lot. father. Priscilla, Priscilla Shire's, Shire's father. father, that's right. <laughs> I know. He, he and his wife did a, a yeah, pretty good job. Yeah, bless her heart, she's in heaven now. But he said something years ago at a Promise Keepers mm -hmm. event. He said, we all came over in different boats, but we're in the same boat now. We are now, like it or not, we that's are. That's right. Yeah. And so I love you. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for your courage and sharing with us. Uh -huh. Thank you for those of you that watch this and share this in previous conversation with Dr. Robinson, my friend Big D, and Dr. G. Mm -hmm. And let's continue to have these conversations together so that we can understand one another instead of just always beating our chest and demanding to be understood and to have our own way. Every politician can learn that. Every person can learn that. Yes, if they and do. I just I love you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. Thank you guys for joining us. Fist bump. That's right. No, we got this con this hand behind us over uh, here. This is a very nice hand. We're gonna we're, we're, we're interlock hands. We love each yeah, other. Yeah, I don't mind that. I yeah, yeah, Big D was yeah, better too. We do that, but you and I. We're I don't mind that. I don't mind. I, I love you, my, my sister and my friend. I love you too, Pastor Ray. I and do. Uh, it's I an really honor do. to serve Christ with you and to love Thank the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen.